Good morning and welcome to another installment of The Traveling Therapist. My name is Lauren Perez. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Illinois. And thank you for watching my video blog. Um, as this is our first official video number one, whoop whoop, we're gonna get into mental health and uh, the crisis work that I do. Not all of my videos are gonna be about crisis, but this one and probably the first several will be because those are the most um, recent cases that I've worked on have been crisis cases. But as new stuff comes in or exciting cases come in, things that have happened with people and it's pretty sad or devastating, but it's exciting in that it's something new, I will be peppering in different things as we go along. So it's not always gonna be crisis and it's not always gonna be children and adolescents, but those will be a majority of my videos. So the case I'm gonna to discuss today, I had a 15 year old boy uh, he is low income. Most of the children that I work with, the adolescents and the children, they're almost all low income. And actually, quite frankly, most of the adults that I work with are middle, upper middle, high class cases. So the, the differences in the issues that the people I work with, how quickly and how opposite, on how much on opposite ends of the spectrum they are, you'll start to see that as we, as the videos start to pile up. But this individual was a 15 year old male. Um, he was being, the, the crisis call came in because he expressed suicidal statements. Uh, he also expressed that his brother was, his older brother was bullying him. His older brother had told him to go kill himself several times. That is a statement that is made quite often in the children and adolescent realm. Um, so whenever him and his brother would get into a disagreement or his brother didn't like what he was doing or saying, he would just tell him, go kill yourself. And he started to internalize this. I mean, it got to the point where he was saying to, it to him so frequently that now he's like, well, maybe I should just go kill myself. So he was expressing homicidal ideation toward his brother because he kept telling him to go kill himself. Suicidal ideation because he started to feel like he was worthless. He, did, he wasn't worthy of being alive. If every little thing he was doing, he was being told to go off himself and uh, he was being bullied at school as well. He didn't really get into uh, all the specific reasons why he's being bullied. It kind of seemed like everything he does in his mind. Uh, there were a couple kids in particular who just made it their mission, their life's goal to really come at this kid that I was seeing. So I get to the hospital. Um, he's in the room, you know, typically how it looks when you get to the ER, you go in, you search for the nurse who called the crisis evaluation in. She, uh, I'll either talk to her, I talk to her always before I go to the hospital, but once I get to the hospital, depending on how severe the case is, I will go look for her. So if it's a case where I really get information and it sounds like the kid's gonna need to either go inpatient or, or um, they're, gonna, they're not gonna be able to be discharged home, they're gonna have to go inpatient, I'll go find the nurse again when I get to the hospital just to get some more information and really make sure that I have all my ducks in a row before I start calling inpatient facilities. But if it's a case where it doesn't sound like the kid is gonna have to go inpatient, then I will oftentimes just arrive to the hospital and then go into the child's room, the adolescent's room, do my evaluation, do all the paperwork, talk to the parent, and then go find the doctor or the nurse. So with this particular case, he had no history of um, suicidal ideation. He had no history of suicide attempts. He had no history of homicide, homicidal behavior. He had never been inpatient and he had no history of medication for depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, nothing. Just a completely clean slate kid. First time he'd ever been involved in crisis, uh, the crisis program, crisis situation. So I go in the room and he's really, really meek and he's looking down and uh, really soft-spoken, kind of flat affect, meaning he, there's not a lot of inflection in his voice. If he gets excited, he doesn't elevate his voice. And when he was really sad, he didn't really get low. It was just kind of this, this, this bass all the time, you know, no really, not animated at all is a good way to describe flat. You know, there's just nothing there. You just hear words. There's no emotion behind the words. So we talk, um, I ask him what's going on. He tells me about his brother. And this is, again, something that I hear often. A sibling of a, a friend, go kill yourself. You know, that's, that's the thing. I remember when I was a kid, it was, why are you being so gay? And now it's, just go kill yourself. They use it in a, what they think is jokingly way, but it's not joking. You know, you know most people don't take that as a joke. Just like most kids didn't take, you're so gay as a joke. 
they took offense to that. Why would you say something like that if, if you know, what does that mean? Why are you using it in a, in a, in a mean way? You're not saying it lovingly, so if, if there's no positive meaning behind what you're saying, you're not saying it to be, to be playful and, and to show affection, you know? <clears throat> so we talked about that. Um, single mom, dad was not in the picture. Mom had a job and a half. So nobody was home when they got home from school. It was usually just him and his brother, and they had a little, a smaller sibling who um, they would walk down to pick up from um, the, a preschool around the corner. They were, for all intents and purposes, they were kind of just free-range kids on their own, no real guidance, and nobody telling them that what they were saying and doing to each other was was. Well, I shouldn't say each other, what his brother was saying and doing. You know, he would tell his mom and his mom would be tired and she would try and deal with it and she would tell him, don't talk to your brother that way. But it wasn't doing anything. You know, it wasn't making any long-standing change. It wasn't impacting him in any way to the fact, to the point where the brother would stop. <clears throat> so uh, after the, the 15 year old and I talk about the situation, I get enough information that he's never had a plan to commit suicide. You know, he's had to without thought. He's had the feeling of hopelessness. Maybe I'm not worthy of being alive. Maybe I shouldn't be here, but he's never acted on it. He's never planned. He's never uh, attempted. So for those reasons, um, I talked to mom, I talked to doctor. He had never had a therapist. He had no supports in place to help him deal with what he was going through from his brother and from the kids at school. Based on that information, and the information provided to me by the 15 year old, uh, I decided to deflect him. Deflections or hospitalizations are the two outcomes that any crisis evaluation can result in. So in this particular case, I decided, okay, I don't feel like he needs to go inpatient. He's not in an imminent, in, an imminent danger to himself or anyone else. He said he had no intention to kill his brother. You know, he just said his brother would tell him to go kill himself and he would yell back, I'm gonna kill you, you know, because he was angry. These kids don't have the, the capacity, the vocabulary, the the, the knowledge, the guidance, really, to use, to express themselves effectively. You know, say what you mean, mean what you say. And a lot, oftentimes with crisis, the kids are saying what they think they mean or what they, how they think they can say it. They're not saying what they mean, and they don't mean what they say. Some kids do want to kill themselves, and those kids, I'm, you know, as we as we prog proceed through and progress along, you're gonna hear a lot about the kids that I've worked with who did try actively want to kill themselves so those kids the, the, you know those cases are coming but this case in particular um he you know I, I wasn't worried about him hurting himself or anybody else so i talked to the doctor the doctor agreed mom agreed mom's the, the the parents opinion is always very valid and the way that the process goes you know we do the evaluation it's, it's a deflection or a hospitalization that's my determination that's how i want to proceed so what i then need to do is go talk to the parent so I go, to, I go find mom, dad, mom and dad, guardian, aunt, uncle, adopt, foster father, whoever, older siblings sometimes. I go find whoever is responsible for this child and I let them know, you know talk to, talk to your, 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 your adolescent and based on what I was told, I feel like a good, deter, a good uh, course of action would be, in the, in the case of a deflection, a good course of action would be for you guys to link up with one of our therapists. We do the crisis evaluations and then we provide 90 days of, of therapy to help de-escalate whatever is causing this kid to be in distress so we meet once a week sometimes we meet twice a week, twice a week depending on the severity and the therapist's availability I mean there's a lot of kids in crisis here in Lake County and um, the job is very hard and a lot of people don't want to do it a lot of people it takes a really special person to do the kind of work that we do and I'll, people will come in you know they and it's good experience they come in they stay for a little bit and then they, they realize it's too much and they leave so oftentimes our caseloads get pretty heavy and the, honestly the pay is not that great. You know, if you're gonna be working 24 hours a day around the clock, seven days a week, you can be on or off at any point. There have been several days I've worked seven, seven straight days, 11 straight days. Unless I took a day off during the week and used my personal time, I would work you know, 11 days to 14 straight days before I would get a day off. That's really difficult to do when your base salary, is, or when your salary, not even your base salary, your salary at the end of the year is $51,000. You know, it's really, really difficult and to sustain that being on all the time and the finances not being there to help you support the work-life balance that you need. So people leave, you know, they stay for a little bit, they get a little experience, they take that knowledge and they go somewhere else. So our caseloads get to be pretty high. 
Um, I talked to mom. I let her know. She said she was absolutely comfortable taking uh, her son home. She didn't think that he was a danger to anyone and that she was going to stay on the older one. That he was going to he was going to lose, you know, access to video games. He was not going to be able to go places. He could not treat his brother this way. She, she, this was her wake-up call. It's unfortunate it came at this. This is the way that it had to come through, but all that matters is that she gets it. So then, after I talk to the parent and the parent agrees that the kid can go home, the next step is to go find the doctor. And sometimes we find doctors who trust what we're doing. You know, I, I'm not just some, some kid out of high school with no experience in mental health, no idea what I'm doing, just making choices willy-nilly on people's lives. You know, this person's life is in my hands. If I send them home and they hurt themselves, that's on me. If they are a danger to themselves and I send them in the hospital, that's on me, not on anybody else. I don't want that on my conscience. If I'm afraid someone's gonna hurt themselves, I am not playing around. You're going in the hospital because we're not risking your life. It's not, it's not worth you risking your life type thing. So sometimes the doctors trust what we're doing. They listen to us, they know we do this every day. We give them our rationale, we give them the follow-up, the uh, treatment plan from there and they most of the time say okay you know go, go, ahead, go ahead and send them home uh leave all the information with you know leave us a copy of your evaluation let the nurse know and you know let the kid know that we'll be discharging shortly great then you get the doctors who get on their high horse and want to play savior so you have a kid who has never experienced suicidal ideations gestures thoughts attempts who has never had therapy before, who has never had support systems in place to make sure that this didn't happen again. They get brought into the ER. Oh, how he got in the ER, that's important. <clears throat> the schools. I understand that schools wanna be preemptive. They wanna make sure that they're doing all the right things to protect kids. I get it. But every single time a kid says something or says anything in the spectrum of self-harm, not even suicide, self-harm, the schools call ambulances and they don't tell the kids, they don't tell the parents. Nobody even knows this is happening until the police and an ambulance roll up in front of the school and they enter the classroom and, and, and say, hey, you, you, can you come with us to the front office? Or they, they'll lie and have the kid come to the office, be like, oh, you know, we need, to, we need to have a conversation with you. They'll bring him into the counselor's office, call the police, hold them in the counselor's office, and then have them removed from the school from that counselor's office. It's traumatizing. It's entrapment, in my opinion. But we'll get more into that because this, is a, this, is a, this problem is a lot deeper than just a kid experiencing suicidal ideation. The problem is schools are not equipped to handle this stuff and i would love to travel the country educating schools on how to properly manage crisis maybe that's something else i can get into after this after these vlogs take off maybe that is something that i can do on my own and i can you know really try and overhaul this process for everyone so that it's not only beneficial to the people who need the help but the schools are not losing the trust of these kids but we'll get to that so he ended up in the ER because he uh, had expressed at school that he, you know, was some, was some, his teacher got on him for something uh, and he didn't want to listen. So he's like, what's the point? I don't want to be here anyway. And she's like, excuse me, what does that mean? What is it? What's the point? I don't want to be here anyway. I don't want to be alive anymore. Like, what, what's the point? Maybe I, what, what, why am I even here? She freaking panics, calls the principal and calls the counselor, sends him to the front office. They call an, an ambulance. They don't even call his mother. And they transport him to the emergency room. And that's how I ended up getting called. Moms didn't bring him in. The school called an ambulance. And the way it works out here in Lake County, I can't speak to every other county. I can't speak to anywhere else in the state. I just know here in Lake County, if the ambulance is called, the police are called because there's a threat that somebody's going to hurt themselves or someone else, they arrive and you have to go. They have to transport you to the emergency room. Adults, maybe they can wave depending on the situation. I don't even think an adult can waive the right to be transported to the emergency room, but a child or an adolescent under the age of 18, they, a school calls, an adult calls and says, hey, this kid made a threat. I'm worried about their safety. That's all it takes. I'm, and they, they 
come get this kid and transport him. So I talked to mom, back, circling back to how we got on this topic. Talk to mom, let her know, go find the doctor. Some doctors are on their high horses. They think they're one, they want to be saviors. In, in their opinion, the school called an ambulance because this kid was such a danger to themselves or others, and they brought them here for a reason. We can't let them go home. It is my duty as a doctor to send this kid inpatient. And, it, and, it, and in, an inpatient um, placement can be traumatic. All of this can be traumatic. You're trying to get this help, kid help because they already have experienced a trauma, but you can exacerbate the trauma. You can make the trauma worse if you put them in an inpatient when they don't need to be. When you take them from the only environment that they know and from everyone that they know and you put them in a strange place for a week, that's, tra that's traumatizing. So this, luckily this doctor was not one of those great savior doctors. This doctor listened. This doctor heard me. This doctor asked good questions, asked for follow-up. Um, I told him, okay, this is what we're gonna do. I don't think the kid's a danger to himself. If you're comfortable with, with the uh, disposition, I'm recommending that the child be discharged back to mom's care. Mom has been made well aware of what's going on with brother, and she will stay on brother. Uh, the kid's never had a therapist, so he'll follow up with our counselors once a week for 90 days minimum. We will meet with him at school or at, or in the office, um, whatever is most appropriate for the family. Oftentimes it's more convenient to see a kid at school because that's where the issues are most likely occurring. And when they're at school, they have to go to school. So if they're at school and the school calls them down, they have to see us. So there's no avoiding getting with your therapist and working through these problems and learning skills. You know, therapy is not a punishment. And society has created this idea that it is a punishment. It's not, we gotta get away from that. It's not a punishment, we, you learn things. And therapy is not forever, it is, it is not forever. It's not supposed to be forever. So if you have a therapist that you've been working with for 25 years, stop seeing that fucking therapist and go get a new one. You are not supposed to be working with anybody for that long because then it becomes a crutch. You haven't learned anything, now you're just dependent on the therapist. We don't do that, we get in, we get, we, we get in there, we fix the problem and we send you on your merry way, release you back into the wild and hope that the skills and the, the things that you've worked on in our sessions are enough to carry you through any future stressors. So I'll, I'll, I'll the doctor know, mom has agreed. She's already completed all the paperwork. She signed all the releases and all the consents for us to get into the school. All of that is, in, is, in, is set up in line. The doctor's like, great, I'm on board. Leave me a copy of your assessment. Uh, the nurse will be in shortly to discharge. Awesome. Go back in the room, get the kids set up, and they go. I, le I always leave my information, my name, my phone number, uh, for to the family and let them know that if you have not been contacted by your crisis assigned your crisis counselor then you call me back and I'll find out who is assigned to you I always say give it a week but it should never take a week you know that's just asinine but within that week most families are contacted most always contacted within that week but things happen people get sick we're overworked we are overbooked I might get sick over the weekend and not be able to get my assessment in on time for it to be reassigned to somebody else. In the event that that happens, I always let people know, just give it a week. It's okay. And in the event that something happens between now and the time your therapist comes around, just call, call us again. And we'll come, you know, we'll, we'll come out, reevaluate, and we'll, we'll get you the services that you need and we'll get you linked up with whoever you need to be linked up with. So that is the crisis portion of my job. The aftercare from that point. Most of the people who I do evaluations on, I do not then work with one on one in counseling. They get assigned to a different therapist. Uh, it's got a lot to do with not wanting uh, there to be too much. Some people work more than others. I'm one of those people who worked a lot of on call shifts. I was on every single Thursday and I was on every single Friday and I worked two weekends a month. And there were some people who just stuck to their rotation, so they would be on two or three times a month. I was on like eight to 10 times a month. If I had to work with every kid that I evaluated, I would be the, one of the few people who had 55 or 60 kids in my 90 day rotation at all times. And there's not enough hours in the day. Not enough hours in the day, and you'd have to pay me six figures to, to work 70 hours a week 
just on counseling sessions and paperwork, not even adding the 15 hours extra a week I could be doing on crisis. So to keep it uh, spread, not norm, you know, to distribute, to distribute it, we were broken up by regions, and then within that region, cases were assigned. So this kid went to someone else. He lived in another part of the county. He was on the northern, the northeastern part of the county, and my office is on the southwestern part of the county. Lie backwards. I'm on the north. I'm on the northwestern side of the county. The kid was on the southeastern side of the county. My bad. Directions are not my always my strong suit, and I'm a little tired, so please forgive me. I flipped it. So he was on a completely different part of the region. Uh, I wouldn't have worked with him anyway. <clears throat> but if I had worked with this kid, I would have first listened. It's so important to, to give people who are struggling a platform to just vent. Sometimes they need a little prompting, and prompting a discussion like that's not difficult. People always say, well, I don't even know how to get them to open up. A question as simple as, do you want to talk about who has been hurting you? Do you want to talk about who has been upsetting you? Do you want to talk about in what way, since I now know this kid is being bullied, how are the kids bullying you? You know, what are they doing? Just describe what it is you're experiencing when you're at school. What are they doing to you? What are they saying to you? What would you like them to stop doing and saying? I'd start there. Let the kid just get it out. And then we work on how not to let the shitty things that, that people say to you, how not to let that get in and stay. It's okay to feel sad and hurt if somebody says something mean to you, if somebody does something mean to you. Pain, sadness, fear, frustration, hopelessness even sometimes. Those are all emotions that deserve to be felt because they, they are there. No one should go through life without ever experiencing fear because the one day that you finally do experience it, you don't know what to do. If you're ill-equipped to deal with emotions on the severe negative side, not even negative, the severe side of the spectrum, everything is not sunshines and rainbows all the time. It is. It can be, you know, it can be really positive, but bad things happen to people who they don't deserve to happen to so if he's sad if he's feeling hopeless if he's feeling like it's never going to get better because in his mind it's not his, he's telling his mother that his brother's telling him to go kill himself and all his brother gets is a don't say that to your brother are you kidding if i told my sister to go kill herself my parents never beat us that probably would have been the one time I, one of my parents would have smacked the shit out of me if i had told my sister why don't you just go kill yourself some offenses deserve a, a, a severe consequence a sibling telling another sibling a person not even a sibling human decency a person telling another person to end their life deserves a reprimand a severe one so he wasn't seeing that happening especially because at school if he says he wants to kill himself or he's feeling hopeless and he doesn't want to be here he gets punished but nobody's punishing the kids who are telling him that he should go do these things and the bullies at school were also telling him to go kill himself. And that's where his brother got it from because he went to go vent to his brother for support. He told him this is what they're saying to me and then his brother weaponized the thing that was eating at him. He weaponized it and he used it against him again. He was being bullied twice. Of course he's gonna feel hopeless. So then we work through that. Yes, you have, there are people in your life who are gonna say terrible things to you. You don't deserve to have those things said to you and we can't control the people who are saying those things. We can't control other people, we can control only ourselves. We have to learn how to cope. We have to process through that stuff. Giving this kid coping skills would have been step number one. You know, we get through and, and he expresses all the things that create stress for him. He processes all that, he shares it, and we, we go through and we work on each of those statements. How can we not let that statement run us? That's what I would teach this kid. Coping skills. 
learning how not to let something in and make it let it stay there and fester. Learn, learning how to sometimes you have to get you have to give it back. So if his brother tells him something nasty, go you know why don't you go kill yourself? He has to come back with with clapbacks. Is that is that what the, is that what the kids are calling them these days? Clapbacks. He needs to have a comeback. What you know. I don't want to tell this kid what he should say, so I, I open the door and, and ask him, what are some of your favorite comebacks? What are some of the things that you hear people say to other people when they're getting picked on that you love? What's, what's the comeback you love to hear? And I teach him how to use that. That's gotta be your armor. Words have to be your armor. Otherwise, they will get in and they'll impact your emotions and then they'll impact your quality of life, your functioning, your ability to see your worth. We work on that for 90 days. Any other things that come up as we go along, it just becomes a daily, you know, let, let's work through it. It's repetitive. It has to be. Until, until this kid comes into my office one day or I go to that kid at school and we're sitting in the conference room and he says, hey, they came at me today. This is what I said and it didn't bother me. It upset me a little bit, but it didn't make me feel like I didn't want to be alive anymore. I actually was excited and I was proud of myself that I was able to stand up for myself. The day that that, that happens, even if it's just one, one time that elevates that kid from hopelessness to I can do this and when you get to I can do this the next step is I I am doing it I will do it I'm gonna do it this is who I am now these things are not gonna bother me anymore and these are not skills that we teach our kids because this idea that they're, they're not gonna go to school and get bullied that they're not gonna have to worry about it it's bullshit kids get bullied listen up everyone moms and dads your fucking kid is probably a bully. If they're not being bullied, they are a bully. Not all, you know, it's not always black and white, but a kid who's complicit with bullying is a bully. So if you're not teaching your kid to stand up to the bullies and your kid's a fucking bully, do better. My daughter is not a bully. I was not a bully. If I saw somebody getting picked on, I stepped in, leave that kid alone. Why are you fucking with that kid? Leave him alone, he ain't do nothing to you. It's not hard to be nice, it is not hard to be nice to each other. And you need to teach your children to not bully because this is what happens. We send our kids to school and some little shit makes them feel like they're not worth being alive. And then they go home and there's a sibling at home who's doing it. So check your kids, check their siblings. And if there is a kid out there who's being, who is being bullied, if you are being bullied, go let somebody know. There's no shame in getting help. You don't deserve it. You don't have to deal with it alone. All it takes is letting someone know so that an intervention can be put into place. It doesn't even have to be you tell the teacher and then the teacher calls the kid over and then now this kid knows you said something. Someone who is skilled in this, in this area, a teacher, a, a, administrators, your parents, they will know how to get the situation straightened out in a roundabout way so that you're not now getting picked on for being a, a tattle. I hate that word. We don't use that word in my house. You're not tattling. You're setting boundaries. The boundaries that you have a right to set. You have a, a square around you. This is your personal space. And if somebody's physical body in, is in, if their words are- oh, I just did it. Fuck, man. Being the traveling therapist is hard. I keep getting all these phone calls and they keep cutting into my video. And I don't want to reshoot this whole thing because now I've been doing it for 35 minutes. So there's going to be lots of splices with this one. Starting next time, I'm going to put my phone on silent mode so that no phone calls get in. And I don't have to do the splicing shit. I had never even thought this was going to be an issue. So apologize in advance that my first video has all these cut ins and cut outs. It's because people keep calling me. Someday I hope to be able to do these in an office. Right now I can't afford it, I don't have an office. I can't do it at my office in the health department. I can't do it in my office in, uh, you know, when I'm doing my crisis, I can't do, do it in the office where I do counseling. There's just no time. Being in the car for the hour that I commute is the one time of day that I can get this done because I can't do it at night, it's dark. I don't wanna turn the light on when I'm trying to film, but even then I'd still be in the car. By the time I get home, it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm too tired. So hopefully, you know, I'll do this for a little while and I'll be able to establish myself in an office and then I can do my traveling therapist from the car because my my, my uh, 
experiences will still be from doing crisis and being out in the community and traveling throughout the community to provide my services to people. So the name will still stick. It'll still be the traveling therapist, but I won't literally be traveling when I film my vlogs. So this is, this is my life. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Um, but yeah, the kid with the box, you know, the, the boundaries, you're not being a tattletale. If somebody calls you a tattletale, tell them that they're being a dick. You tell them, I'm not being a tattle. I'm setting boundaries that I have a right to set. And if you don't like the fact that I'm setting boundaries, then you have a problem. That's what you say to somebody who says that you're being a tattletale, that you're being a snitch, that you're being a crybaby. No, you're not. You are setting boundaries. And setting boundaries early in your life and setting healthy boundaries early on in your life sets you up to be a, a functioning adult because you're gonna have to set boundaries for the rest of your life. Start learning how to do it now, which is what I would teach that kid in counseling. To the parents in this situation, if you find out that your child is being picked on, you need to go to the school and you need to have a meeting set with the principal, the teacher. Uh, first, start there. Let them know that it has been brought to your attention that your child is being picked on and you want something done about it. And give them the opportunity to straighten it out. Sometimes it just takes a parent bringing this information to light on behalf of their child and changes in the classroom being made, uh, more eyes being placed on your child and the child that's doing the picking on. And sometimes that's enough. Sometimes you do that and it continues. So then you have a second meeting. And in the second meeting, you want the principal, you want the teacher, and you want the parents to the kid who is bothering your kid. Because they, either they don't know, they don't care, or they're so wrapped up in their own stuff that they can't manage it and they need help because it does take a village to raise a family and it does take a team to get to the bottom of interpersonal conflict with children and adolescents they, you know they can't deal with it on their own and it can't be one-sided it can start one-sided with one parent going to the school and letting the, the teacher and the school straighten it out within the classroom but if you do that and in a week later it pops up again if a year later it pops up again okay well we tried it your way no I want the, I want the parent I want to have a sit down with the parent I need to know what is happening in your house that makes your child think it's okay to come at my kid because it's not okay you have that second meeting and if you have that third meeting you let everybody know if this doesn't stop I'm gonna take it public you know I'm gonna I'm gonna let everybody know whether it's you going and talking to a private newspaper or you putting a blast on social media that the school is not taking care of this bullying issue if other parents are aware of a particular student and the classroom belonging to this teacher we don't want to put the names of the kids because they're they're kids but the adults in the situation the teacher's name if you have a kid in this class Please check with your child to see if one of the kids, one of the male students or one of the female students, you can emphasize a, um, a gender, one of the female identified students or one of the male identified students in that class has picked on your child, please contact me because this is now escalated to the point where I've given the school an opportunity to turn it around and they still have not and my child is still being picked on. We need to get together as a team and collaborate on the behalf of our children. That's what you do. You, you community organize that shit. If you have questions or concerns about how to deal with this, you guys can always reach out to me through my website, EWA Illinois, I L L I N O I S dot org. You can uh, leave me comments here underneath this video, and I check the comments all the time. Um, on my website, you can submit, in, you know, you can submit a question, you can uh, submit an inquiry whether you leave a phone number, you leave an email, I'll read, you can reach out to me and then I'll see what I can do to help you out. I have knowledge, I have skill, I have a, a, an understanding of school systems and working with crisis and suicide ideation, self-harm, depression, anxiety, you name it. I have experience in those areas and it would be really, really exciting to help, to help you. Because no kid deserves to spend eight hours a day in an environment where they're being mistreated whether that environment's at home or that environment is a school. It is a camp in the summer. It is a, uh, you know, a musical, a mu music. If they're, if they're in a band or a choir, they're being picked on. It doesn't matter where they are. They do not deserve to be made 
miserable by another person. We gotta stop that. And I am 100% on board to help any and everybody who needs the help. So leave, leave a comment, submit an inquiry, and I'll help you in any way that I can. If after watching this video you had a question, a comment, you wanna have me address something from this video in the start of my next video, by all means, please do let me know. Uh, but thanks for watching The Traveling Therapist. I hope I didn't leave anything out. If you have a question about the story, if you feel like I left a piece out or you something was not linking, please just reach out. Um, this is just my first time doing this. Every video will get more, um, will feel more sequential in the story and how it goes and all that great stuff. But you know, maybe it will. Maybe I'm just gonna be all over the place because this is what the life of a social worker looks like. You know, buckle up, baby. Anyway, let me know. It was a really uh, a pleasure filming this. I, I liked this kid in particular and his story and the things that he's dealing with are very common and I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about all of this stuff and I think that when a person has passion, it makes it, it's contagious. Passion, being passionate about something is contagious. So if you have a passion about something, go for it. Make a, make a video blog about it. Share it with the world. What do you got to lose? You guys take care. Have a good day. Be well. Another, another uh, point or another thought on this particular case, this 15 year old. He was experiencing suicidal thoughts, feelings of hopelessness, ideation. Is my life worth living? Questions. But a suicidal thought, this is for the parents and the schools out there, the adults listening to this, because the kids need you to know. A suicidal thought is not a suicidal plan. A suicidal thought is not a suicidal gesture. That means just because a kid expresses hopelessness, just because a kid even says, I don't even know, I wanna die. Did that kid have the capacity to say, I'm sad, I'm upset because I'm being picked on and it makes me feel hopeless. I'm worried that this is never gonna stop and no one's ever gonna do anything about it. Did the kid have the capacity to say that? No, most kids don't. But the go-to is, whatever, I'll just kill myself. Or whatever, I wanna die, I don't care. I don't wanna be here anymore. Adults even say shit like that. You'd be surprised how many of the adults I work with who come into my office and go, I don't care, whatever. Maybe I just shouldn't even be here anymore. You know what, how, 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 how at 36 years old do you not have the, the capacity to say that you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed? scared, overburdened, backed into a corner, not heard, ignored, say those things. But children and adolescents, more often than they do, they do not know how to say that. So if a kid expresses suicidal thought or gesture, do not assume that that means, I'm sorry, not gesture, suicidal ideation, thought, hopelessness it endorses severe hopelessness or worthlessness do not assume that that means that kid is going to go home and kill themselves that's not the way it works a kid's not going to come to school and say you know what i feel hopeless or i feel worthless i feel like i want to kill myself or maybe i just shouldn't be here anymore and then turn around five minutes later and they go home and kill themselves it is a slow burn to get to the place where somebody takes their life they don't go from being fine to not fine in the blink of an eye and they are not um, hope they are there they are not so far gone that the situation can't be straightened out with mental health services if they express that okay what do we do about it what you do is you if your area has a crisis agency a uh, Usually community mental health services, or I'm sorry, community mental health centers offer the service where you can call this number for, for Illinois, Lake County. Ours is, the, is a, the mobile response team. You call this number, it's a centralized location. You tell them what's going on and they then dispatch out the crisis workers in your county, your area, your region. A worker will come out to your home to your to the hospital usually you know we were in the emergency rooms but we do go out to schools and we do go out to homes I wish we didn't go out to homes but the reality is we do 
uh, we go out and we evaluate. We talk to this kid, we talk to the families, we ask about what they've observed. The kids are really, really open with us. When you ask an adolescent, hey, you, we got a call that you said you wanted to hurt yourself. And the person, the people are usually trained in getting the kids to open up. But sometimes all it takes is a, you know, what's going on that makes you feel like your life's not worth living? That question alone sometimes can open a floodgate in a kid and they just let it out. They pour it all out. And sometimes they do need to go inpatient. But those are the kids who have a plan or they've attempted. But majority of the time, the kid doesn't need to go anywhere. They just need to have a therapist that they can go see weekly to get some skills and learn some things. But I just really wanted to add that suicidal thoughts or hopeless thoughts, statements, they are not always a five alarm fire. You know, sometimes, yeah, if a kid says, I am going to go in my room and fucking cut my wrists, that's not just a suicidal thought. That's a plan. Now we're having a different conversation. I'm gonna go upstairs and find your gun and shoot myself. That's a plan. Whatever, I don't wanna be here. Maybe I'll just go kill myself. Maybe I should just die. Look at the situation. Did you take away a video game? Did you tell them that they couldn't go out with their friends? Did you refuse to buy them a new pair of shoes? Did you forget to attend something that was important to them and they're now angry? Uh, please forgive me, I'm just getting over a cold. If that happened, look at the totality of the, search, the circumstances. You have to connect dots. And I know it can be scary to have an 11-year-old tell you that they don't feel like their life's worth living. But listen to them. You know, not, don't, don't react. There's a difference between reacting and responding. A reaction is something that you do on an impulse. You hear this thing, it scares you, and then you just make a, cho make a choice. Well, this is what we have to do. We have to go do this thing. It's like a panic. You're in panic. But responding, your kid has said this thing to you. Ask some questions. Get a little bit more information. And then straight up ask them. Do you really want to die? You know, if do you, are, you, are you putting together a plan? Do you have a plan to end your life? Do you really feel like everybody around you this is a good question because sometimes kids don't respond to um, do you really have a plan or do you really want to be do you really want to die the golden question that usually gets a kid to open up even further do you really feel like the rest of us would be better off if you weren't here and a lot of kids who want to kill themselves will say yes I do I don't think you are better you're, you're better off here with me that's where you need some a trip to the emergency room a, a call to an ambulance if they respond to that and they go and they just go off on this yes I, you don't I don't want to be here because I'm just a burden you know what have you whatever it is that they would say if they say sometimes you know then it's not like suicide's right on the forefront of their mind. But this isn't stuff that you have to try and tease through on your own. You know, if, if they say yes to that question or they say sometimes, then just get a hold of the crisis agency. But it's the difference between you calling an ambulance and having them transported versus just having somebody come out to your home. Or you driving to that agency and walking in and being like, hey, I really think that my kid needs an evaluation. Can you help? You can do that too. You know, the, these offices are often open till seven, eight o'clock. They have to work late nights to see their to see their client their client pool, and sometimes people are in the office just doing paperwork. You know, whenever somebody came into our office, if one of us was free, we didn't just turn them around and go, okay, we'll go to the emergency room. If somebody came into my office, more and more times than I, I count on one, two hands, I did an evaluation in the office. You don't have to go to the emergency room. I'm, I'm here. I can do it. Let's go in my office and we'll figure out what to do from there. So I just wanted to add that onto the end of the video. Thank you.